So, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Ben, uh, the Secretary of the ACNS. I'm so honored to uh, to help uh, share uh, and moderate this uh, section. So, uh, today's chair would be uh, Professor Kimura, who is the Associate Professor of the Department of Neurosurgery of the Kobe University Graduate School of Medicine uh, in Japan. So today we have uh, two speakers, uh, Professor Kono and Professor uh, Ricardo, and also we have our wine and speaker, uh, Dr. Dr. Heber. So, um, so uh, may I first uh, invite our chair, Professor Kimura, to introduce our two uh, expert uh, speakers. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Uh, Hello everyone, and good evening, and good morning, and good day. And uh, I'm Hideo Kimura, Kobe University of Japan. It's a great honor for me to chair the ACNS YNS this webinar. Uh, thank you, nice to see you again here. I'm very, very happy to be here. <laughs> thank you. Now I ask you, President Okato uh, and our both speakers, our colleagues, and and today, uh, good to see you. I'm very glad to introduce the first speaker, uh, Professor Hideaki Ono. Uh, he will talk about today their safe and secure, secure cerebral vascular surgery using a skull based approach, surgical field de development, and revascularization. So I'm looking forward to hearing your presentation. So, Professor. Please start your presentation when you are ready. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And thank you very much. Um, hello, everybody, and uh, thank you for introducing uh, Dr. Kimura. Uh, I'm Hideaki Ono from Fuji Brain Institute the Hospital. I'd like to share my uh, slide. <laughs> okay. And uh, it's okay. Slide okay. You... Yes. You can see okay. the street. Okay. Uh, I'd like to start. Sure. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Kato and uh, all the doctors uh, who gave me the opportunity to make this presentation. I'd like to talk today about safe and secure cerebral vascular surgery using skull based approach, surgical field development, and revascularization. Our hospital is right in the middle in Shizuoka Prefecture. Mount Fuji, Japan's most famous mountain, is located here. Our hospital is located at the foot of Mount Fuji. This is Mount Fuji and our hospital. Uh, this is Mount Fuji and our hospital. And uh, our hospital is surrounded by tea plantations from which Shizuoka's famous tea is grown. Our hospital plays a central role in stroke care in this area. 24 hours, 365 days, anytime, anyone, anything, are our slogan. And we are in charge of treating about 900 stroke patients and conducting about 500 operations every year. I am the only uh, board neurosurgeon, and this year I am working with five residents. My current mission is to provide the best medical care in Japan to this area and to reduce young neuro uh, and to educate young neurosurgeons. Uh, through the treatment of many patients, I hope to pass on my knowledge, skills, and attitude to young doctors and they make, make their life as a neurosurgeon happy. Uh, today, I'd like to talk, uh, share with you what I always take care of and what I tell young doctors focusing on aneurysm and bypass surgery. Neurosurgical care includes a variety of treatments, including aneurysm, brain tumors, and ischemia, as shown here. And this is a case of a man in his 60s with basilar top aneurysm. Uh, I conducted clipping of the aneurysm, and the zygoma is removed and craniotomy is performed. And the sphenoid bridge and lateral orbital were firmly removed so that the surgical field is wide, as wide as possible and right can enter. A fissure is opened with high magnification. 
the ocular motor nerve is identified here, the ocular motor nerve, and the uh, posterior communicating, communicating artery is cut, and the basilar artery is secured. And the aneurysm, uh, both necks are identified. There was a perforator directing uh, behind the aneurysm. So uh, clippers performed to preserve the perforator behind the aneurysm. Uh, confirming that the clip is not uh, clip the perforator and good blood flow in the perforators and no blood flow in the aneurysm was confirmed using uh, ICZ video angiography. The patient followed the uh, paper, of course. Like this uh, clipping uh, in recent years, neurosurgery must be safe, reliable, and minimally invasive. I think these are, in other words, uh, kindness to patients. Safe, secure, and minimally invasive are major three required elements for patient friendly neurosurgery. To conduct safe surgery, we have to obtain good final surgical field, getting a good view. To operate securely, we should make good setting that enables simple operation. To reduce invasion, we have to operate gently to brain, cranial nerves, arteries, and veins. These are our final view of aneurysm creeping, left or uh, IC aneurysms and basilar top aneurysms. And getting final surgical field that enables safe and secure operation is our top priority in aneurysm surgery. We need to confirm following things. All the important structures visible? Can we operate instruments easily? And all the performance are gentle to brain and cranial nerves? To get a good final surgical field, we temporarily move away these normal structures with minimal invasion skin, muscle, bone, brain, nerve, artery, and veins, which encounters before approaching aneurysm. First, I would like to talk about craniotomy. The goal of craniotomy is to get a good final surgical field, which enables good view of important structures, including PCOM and anterior corridor artery. This is a case of clipping of left internal carotid artery aneurysm after subarachnoid hemorrhage due to rupture of an aneurysm on the contralateral side. Head rotation should be about 30 degrees to allow the temporal lobe to fall under its own weight. We made skin incision, not damaging superficial temporal artery because we use STA for bypass in case of an emergency. We elevate skin flap and the temporal muscle separately. Skin flap is elevated at the upper layer of the deep temporal fascia, not to damage the facial nerve, like this. We make markings so that the temporal muscle can be neatly returned to its original position. The temporal muscle is detached from anterior part and put posteriorly without cutting. And three birthful craniotomy is made, especially paying attention to firmly open the temporal base direction, this side. After craniotomy, we use drill, and we drill and flatten the sphenoid ridge and lateral roll or orbit. This method enables us to get a view from more laterally, posterior, as compared with ordinary one-layer craniotomy. After opening the dura mater, we next open the Sylvian fissure. At this time, we have to care not to damage brain, artery, and veins. First step of opening the Sylvian fissure is dissecting veins. We have to keep in mind that veins are covered circumferentially by arachnoid membrane, and we have cut both superficial and deep layer of membranes. Also, we need to understand anatomical structures such as superficial Sylvian veins and deep middle cerebral veins. To open the fissure, giving adequate tension is necessary not to damage brain. When retracting brain, we should not retract literally, but move and support the brain without changing their volume. This point is very important. It seems to be very difficult for young neurosurgeons, and they tend to use retractor to press the brain. 
This can damage the brain and make the maneuver more difficult because the space is reduced. Use retractor only to move and support the brain. This make it easier to open the fissure. Also, to open the fissure effectively, we should cut from peri-arterial space in deep layer. There is always space around the arteries and a large space in the depths, and we use that space. This is easier and gentle to brain, preserving pia matter. The goal of operation is creeping aneurysm, safely and securely. To achieve this goal, expanding final surgical field is essential. To get this final field in which we can confirm important structures, we have to move brain like this. We should be conscious of moving the entire brain rather than putting hard on a on local part. Considering this movement of brain, we should start opening cerebral fissure from this distal point. And this is a case of female uh, in her 50s with right ICPC aneurysm. After opening the dura mater, we firstly carefully observed the running of the veins. We decided to enter between the veins perfusing from the frontal and temporal side. We begin uh, dividing the vein here so that we can use uh, the, this uh, space and artery. The thick arachnoid surrounding the cerebrum vein is cut. The thin veins uh, crawling along the temporal is returned to uh, the temporal side like this. Uh, cut the arachnoid membrane and enter into the deep layer along the artery. Separate the frontal lobe, the cerebrum vein, and the temporal lobe adequately so that the brain moves as a whole. We cut the arachnoid at the base side, which restricts the movements of the veins, uh, so-called uh, denuta veins. In this case, the M1-2 bifurcation was plunged into temporal lobe, so the artery is taken away from the temporal lobe. And we reach the internal carotid artery along the uh, M1. And first, secure the uh, internal carotid artery at the proximal side of the aneurysm. We also check the A1 for contingency. To confirm the posterior communicating artery and the anterior corridor artery behind the internal carotid artery, we cut the arachnoid membrane at the temporal base and move the temporal lobe posteriorly. The anterior corridor artery uh, was attached to the uh, aneurysm breath, so the IC was temporarily occluded to peel off it. Both necks of the aneurysm are confirmed, and the anterior corridor and posterior communicating artery perforators, also at the back, are confirmed and clipped uh, to preserve them. This is a, a final image. The patient had a good course. <laughs> this is a case of a woman in her 40s with left vaginal SC aneurysm. Due to her intense family history, she cried and asked me to perform the surgery. I thought uh, that the stent assisted coiling would be a good option, but she was allergic to nickel, so we decided to clip the aneurysm. Since the position of the aneurysm was high, I removed the zygoma and opened the cranium so that I could see well and get, get good light. Since I need to reach the basilar artery from the posterior space of the internal carotid artery, the temporal lobe and the artery and vein were well dissected so that the temporal lobe could move posteriorly.
and the retroactor was placed it was placed in that space to move the temporal lobe posteriorly. The arachnoid membrane of base and around the oculomotor nerve were also dissected. And uh, basal artery was secured, and first the proximal portion was unsecured and the aneurysm was confirmed. Both necks was not adhered to the, uh, both necks were identified and the uh, perforated posterior to the aneurysm was not adhered in this case. And the aneurysm was great. Now the perforator was patent. Uh, uh, confirmed using ICZ video and geography. The patient also had a good course. And this is a case of a man in his 60s, 60s with subacronic hemorrhage. He had three aneurysms, MCA, ICPC, and vaginal top aneurysms. Uh, because of the irregular shape of the ICPC aneurysm, we considered rupture of this one, but we also considered that possibility of rupture of the vaginal top aneurysm and decided to do all preparations we could. The carotid artery was secured at the neck, the zygoma was removed, and the crinoidectomy was performed. While irrigating the clothes, the cerebrum fissure was opened as in the unruptured case. MCA was not uh, ruptured. I, after identifying the internal carotid artery, considering the possibility that the ICPC aneurysm had ruptured, both necks were checked and the aneurysm was fearfully and dissected. The aneurysm had an irregular shape, but was not ruptured. At this point, uh, we thought the, that the basal artery top aneurysm was ruptured one and decided to attack. ICPC aneurysm was gripped at this time. Since the basilar top aneurysm was relatively low, the basilar artery was secured from the lateral side of the oculomotor nerve by following the SCA. The basilar artery was temporarily occluded here, and when I went to see the basilar top aneurysm, I found a thick hematoma and also a rupture point. The bilateral necks were identified and the aneurysm was dissected circumferentially, and the clip was upright. After confirming that the perforator was not uprooted, the procedure was terminated. The patient had a good course. The opening of the interhemisphere fissure is similarly conducted with moving bilateral frontal rope effectively. This is a case of uh, acom aneurysm in a man in his 50s. The aneurysm is wide, wide neck aneurysm, and we decided to grip it by interhemispheric approach. The brain had not yet atrophied, so it was necessary to open a tight interhemispheric fissure. First, the visual axis is turned posteriorly, and the fissure is opened and the corpse carosum is confirmed. Then, turn the visual axis towards the base and open the fissure. Appropriate tension is applied uh, with the retractor. The arachnoid between uh, the fissure is visualized and what needs to be cut is cut. The tough seemed continuous, but we patiently uh, continue this operation. When all the interhemispheric fissure was opened, an aneurysm is identified. First, security proximal artery, A1. The left side neck was secured. And one artery was adhered to the aneurysm, so carefully dissected it. 
the right side neck was also confirmed, and the clip was <clears throat> and the clip was applied. <clears throat> Care was taken not to pinch the artery at the back. The blood embedded in the right frontal row was dissected, and the blood flow in the hypothermic artery at the back of the aneurysm was pers persistently confirmed using ICZ video angiography. The remaining components were clipped with fenestrate clip. Blood flow to the aneurysm was observed, so the remaining component was clipped and the surgery was completed. Six months later, MRI didn't show any change in the medial frontal lobe. Revascularization is a very effective means to enhance surgery safety. Revascularization is used not only to prevent ischemia by temporary occlusion yeah, during dangerous or difficult maneuver situations, but also at therapeutic arterial occlusion and for coexisting atherosclerotic lesions. Thanks to the seniors, revascularization surgery is established techniques. To conduct bypass surgery, basics are important. We have to understand the basics and practice to do revascularization safely and securely. I have had several opportunities to write papers on bypass surgery to benefit young doctors. I show you a video of an actual bypass surgery. This is a case from my residency. Under the microscope, patient, uh, parietal branch of the superficial temporal artery is harvested directly above, and the frontal branch is harvested from behind the skin flap. The cranium is opened and the recipient is determined and the STA and the MCA are prepared. This preparation is important to ease the anastomosis procedure. The anastomosis is carefully sutured using 10 o nylon to ensure that the intima and intima are aligned. The needle is inserted perpendicular to the vessel wall to ensure that it passes through all layers of the vessel wall. This is a very delicate operation, but it is performed carefully and surely under the maximum magnification of a microscope. It is a very delicate process, but with practice, every neurosurgeon will learn to do it. After uh, confirming good blood flow, the surgery was terminated. To perform bypass surgery safely and securely, practice is very important and mandatory. As shown in these pictures here, we practice anastomosis procedure by sewing gold fibers together and using a blood vessel of a chicken wing. In particular, I believe that practice using the blood vessels of a chicken wing is very effective in getting, gaining experience that is close to actual surgery. It is also good practice for your surgery your surgery other than bypass surgery. We always have the doctors assigned to our hospital practice more than 30 times on the wings before they actually perform microsurgical procedures. Practice is very important, but we have to use our brains in practicing. He is a famous Japanese baseball player who was active in a recent World Baseball Classic. He says, they say practice doesn't lie, but it is realized if you don't use your brains. This is an actual practice at our hospital. We have actual microscopes in our office where we can practice at any time. And 10 or nine needle threads are also available for use at the hospital. On the right is a picture of an anastomosis process practice using a chicken wing blood vessel. Vascular anastomosis also plays an active role in aneurysm surgery. This is a case of a uh, 17 millimeter large middle cerebral artery aneurysm. And we decided to make bypass in case of ischemia because we thought the operating time would be long. 
the Steve A was harvested, but only the parietal branch was secured because the frontal branch was running low. The Serbian fissure was opened and the aneurysm was identified. One artery, this artery, uh, was protruding from the aneurysm door, its dome itself, and the vessel couldn't be preserved at creeping the dome. So a bypass was necessary to reconstruct it. Also, the bypass was performed in a slightly deeper location. We followed the same basic procedure as the bypass on the surface of the brain and ensure that the intima and the unintima uh, were attached. If you can do bypass on the surface of the brain uh, with regular practice, you will be able to do it. After making the bypass, the aneurysm was trapped. The dome of the aneurysm was punctured directly, decompressed, and the clip was applied. Since the aneurysm was large and the atherosclerosis was strong, we couldn't seal it completely with only one clip, so we temporarily occluded arteries again and added two, two clips to block the blood flow into the aneurysm. Uh, the patient had a good course in this case. Uh, this is a case of subarachnoid hemorrhage due to dissection of the non portion of the middle cerebral artery, which also caused uh, cerebral infarction at, at the same time. The M1 dissection needs to be trapped and the blood flow must be secured to distally along with its sacrifice. Considering the spasm phase, we decided to perform a high flow bypass. The right cervical carotid bifurcation was secured. STA was meticulously prepared and the craniotomy was performed. Subzygomatic tunnel was made for the uh, radial artery graft. The cerebrum fissure was split uh, under the operating microscope. The hematoma was irrigated and removed carefully. First, a backup STA M3 bypass was made distal to the M2 portion for radial artery graft anastomosis. Because of the strong arteriosclerosis, we passed the needle through all layers of the vessel, including the intima, to ensure that there is no dissection. Then, uh, next, the harvested radial artery graft was gently put through the subzygomatic tunnel. The distal end of the uh, RAG was anastomosed to the M2 of the MCA, and the proximal end was anastomosis, anastomosed to the external carotid artery. Uh, the patency of the anastomosis was confirmed. The M1 portion was exposed carefully from both sides, proximally and distally. The large dissecting aneurysm with a purplish red wall was identified arising from the M1 trunk. Part of the vessel walls was broken and thrombus was protruded. The dissecting aneurysm of M1 portion was trapped and the artery arising from both sides of the region were preserved. Post-operatively, we confirmed that the operation was successfully performed according to the pre-operative design. We tried to report unusual cases as case reports like this one. Next, I show cases of embryectomy. Although thrombectomy is standard of care for large vessel occlusion, there are cases in which thrombectomy is not possible in this way. A male in his 40s was discovered with right hip paresis and total aphasia in the morning at the bedtime and transported to our hospital. NIH stroke scale was 21. CT showed left hyperdense MCA sign and MRI revealed, uh, MRI revealed MR occlusion and severe stenosis of left ICA. 
Left carotid angiography revealed severe stenosis of left cervical ICA and vertebral angiography showed left posterior communicating artery. Based on these findings, we diagnosed left MR occlusion due to the severe stenosis of cervical ACA. Because thromectomy was difficult due to the narrow ICA, we conducted surgical embryotomy. Frontal temporal craniotomy was made and Sherbian fissure was dissected with high magnification. We confirmed that the embryos located at M1, M2 bifurcation. Here. And M1 was secured. Alpha proximal control. A tyrotomy was made at the bifurcation and the embryos was retrieved. Thus, a solid amount of growth was removed. And blood flow from the M1 and, uh, was confirmed and the, uh, the site of uh, arteriotomy was sutured. Another embrace existed at M2 superior trunk bifurcation. Uh, and this embrace was also retrieved just as before. After suturing the arteriotomy site, anterior grade blood flow of MCA was confirmed by Doppler and ICA, uh, ICG video angiography. Uh, also, we confirmed that there was no blood flow deficit area in surgical field. Postoperatively, the stroke has progressed slightly, and the MRA revealed left MCA recanalization by a cross flow. STMCA bypass was conducted one week after the onset, and he was transferred to a rehabilitation ward. In a case with a large volume of clot, thrombectomy is also difficult. A female in his 60s was found perhaps in her house with right paralysis and transferred to our hospital. NIH stroke scale was 23. MRI revealed left ICA occlusion and scattered infarction. Electrocardiogram showed atrial fibrillation. Left carotid angiography showed a close, a crab close sign at cervical bifurcation of carotid artery. Right carotid angiography showed cross flow to left side by anterior communicating artery, but the MCA was not perfused. Based on these findings, we considered that the clot was preserved, present from cervical bifurcation to the intracranial terminal portion of ICA. And we, conduct, we conducted an embryectomy. Craniotomy and cervical exposure. <clears throat> Craniotomy and cervical exposure as started simultaneously. The Serbian fissure was widely dissected to expose the ICA terminal. Atherosclerotic ICA was occluded by embryos. The embryos was retrieved through uh, transverse uh, atherotomy made near its distal end. At this time, vigorous anterior grade blood flow didn't reopen. Site of arteriotomy, arteriotomy was sutured and cross flow by anterior or posterior communicating artery to MCA area was recanalized. Arteriotomy was made at cervical carotid artery and the embryos was aspirated. Uh, but the retrograde blood flow was not confirmed. To retrieve residual embryos around the cavernous portion of ICA, arteriotomy was made at intracranial ICA. Embrus was washed out from inserted shunt tube in cervical ICA to intracranial ICA. And very large amount of embryos was retrieved like this. An arteriotomy site of intracranial ICA was sutured, ensuring preserving of preserving vision of the lumen, paying attention to atherosclerosis. At this time, anterograde flow was recanalized through shunt tube. Cervical carotid artery was also sutured. 
Finally, anterograde blood flow was confirmed by Doppler both cervical and intracranial ICA. Postoperatively, the infection hardly spread and ICA recanalized, but the patient couldn't have a good outcome due to acute renal failure. We considered multiple organ failure occurred due to multiple embolization. To reduce strain on the brain, skull base approach is also effective. This is a case of subarachnoid hemorrhage due to basilar artery dissection. Also, this is a difficult case regarding the treatment strategy. We decided to perform basilar SCA bypass and basilar occlusion at proximal to the dissection, distal to ICA. The ST was harvested under the operating microscope. After cutting the uh, zygoma and moving it downward with temporal muscle, a temporal craniotomy was performed with four bar fold. The temporal base was flattened and the middle fossa dura was detached from the middle skull base. The foramen spinosum was identified and middle meningeal artery was coagulated and transected. Anterior petrosectomy was conducted by drilling the Kawase's triangle, which is surrounded by the greater superficial petrosal nerve, arcuate eminence, and the lateral edge of the mandibular nerve. Dural incision was made in the middle cranial fossa and posterior fossa, and the superior petrosal sinus was cut at downward. Uh, for and uh, and to add the uh, at forward to preserving the uh, venous root from petrosal vein. That interior was cut and the SCA was exposed. SCA was exposed by opening the ambient system and prepared SCA was anastomosis to anastomose to SCA. We have to uh, conduct we have to conduct anastomosis at deep. But what we have what we have to do is uh, is as same as the brain surface. The anastomosis is carefully sutured to ensure that the intima and the intima are aligned. The patency of bypass blood flow was confirmed by a Doppler flowmetry. The hematoma in the subarachnoid space around the trigeminal nerve was removed and the trochlear nerve was freed anteriorly by cutting the tent. The trigeminal nerve was exposed anteriorly and basilar artery was identified by flowing the CA proximal. The dissecting arenism was and the bifurcation with ICA was confirmed in the proximal part and clip was uh, applied to just distal to ICA. And the operation was completed. As I have mentioned, we are performing surgery by making full use of surgical field development, skull-based approach, and revascularization. But are we really performing patient-friendly operation? To answer this question, we perform pre- and post-operative cognitive performance tests in addition to evaluating the patient's symptoms and the imaging such as CT and MRI. This is a paper reporting the results of pre- and post-operative cognitive performance for high flow bypass and proximal occlusion of a giant aneurysm of internal carotid artery. In addition to conduct safe, secure, and minimally invasive operation, patient-friendly neurosurgery requires attention to appearance. The patient is most concerned about cosmetics. The craniotomy is made to develop the surgical field enough to minimize the burden of the brain, but it is important to return it, it, its, uh, to its original position. Uh, in order to perform patient-friendly surgery, it is important to perform safe, secure, and minimally invasive surgery on the brain. 
to achieve this, it is effective to perform surgery using surgical field development, skull-based technique, and revascularization. It is also important to pay attention to the patient's most important aspect of the surgery, that is, the patient's appearance. Uh, thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Professor Arnold. You showed us uh, so fantastic cases and you successfully treated all so difficult cases, including the basal SC aneurysm and the basal trunk aneurysm. And of course, of course you, you did uh, successfully several kinds of bypass uh, taking bypass anastomosis, including, uh, of course, bas and STMC and bas uh, STSC anastomosis. So fantastic. Congratulations for your successful surgery. I was so impressed. So maybe there may be a several kind of questions you have, dear colleagues, but um, I have I have a few, few questions first. So after that, uh, I'll ask another guys to another questions. So first, uh, so maybe for our cases, for our, our treating, in treating the aneurysm, sometimes we have to, of course, the uh, unruptured cases, of course, we have to treat the ruptured cases. So what is the technical difference with, uh, to treat the uh, main difference between the ruptured case for the unruptured case? Because you you treat the patient to the sharp dissection technique. So in, in to perform the sharp dissection, the blood clot is hinder your surgical manipulation. First, we have to flush out the blood clot to make the clean surgical field. In a rupture case, maybe it's sometimes too difficult to manage to control the uh, the to to make the to create the clear surgical field. So, how do you control? How do you make your clear surgical field, uh, especially in the rupture case? Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, as you mentioned, uh, it is very difficult to uh, conduct uh, aneurysm creeping in rupture cases because the because we can't uh, see well the structures. Uh, or, so irrigating the hematoma is very uh, very uh, very very important in the rupture cases. Also. Uh, uh, from the social social aspects, the young neurosurgeons firstly uh, conduct uh, surgery in the ruptured cases, but uh, unruptured cases are more more uh, easy easier. Uh, so we we conduct uh, or, or in our hospital in my hospital, young doctors uh, conduct unruptured case first and uh, and. Will understand the structure, uh, arteries and veins and brains, mm -hmm. and then next uh, try to do the ruptured cases. So in the ruptured cases, um, it is very important to uh, understand the normal structures uh, well in the unruptured cases, and then um, in the ruptured cases, um, irrigate well and not not reach deep uh, early, uh, no, uh, we have to uh, irrigate and clean the surgical field, uh, removing the hematoma. Uh, and in that, in, the, in that operation, removing the um, hematoma in, uh, yeah, so, uh, so no, so uh, understand the normal structure and uh, um, removing the clot and the, as possible as, as much as uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you and uh, so yeah it is very important yeah. I I also also thinking about uh, every every surgery in a rupture case. Of course, we have to make a clear surgical field. I want to stress about the importance of the to make the clear surgical field. 
for the, especially for the young neurosurgeon. So irrigating the clot uh, continuously and to making the surgical field in the rapture case, of course, very important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And so if any, uh, you, uh, if any questions from the audience? If, if I may ask one question, Dr. Kimura. Yeah. Sensei, thank you very much. It was such a brilliant uh, demonstration of uh, microsurgical skills and we are really impressed. Uh, and thank you for teaching us. I was particularly impressed about the emergent microvascular thrombectomy microsurgical thrombectomy in your case. Just I would like to uh, ask you, what is your uh, outcome and how many patients experience you have in your place and what is the total outcome that you have got by emergent microsurgical thrombectomy in stroke? Oh, sorry, Eto. So you mentioned that, uh, how many cases of the embryotomy? Yes. I conducted. Ah, okay. It's outcome. 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 Yeah. outcome, outcome, okay. And the outcome of the patient is uh, uh, nearly a uh, thrombectomy. But, but the uh, no, recanalization is about uh, over 90%. 90%? Over 90%. Okay. Only the cases of the atherosclerosis case, uh, we cannot uh, recanalize. But in that case, we can conduct bypass surgery at the same time. So, so the total number of cases may be how many? A uh, total number, uh, over 100 cases. OK. okay. That, that would be one of the largest series in the world, because uh, last week only the EMEAS trial was published by Jerry Fielder, which is emergent microsurgical thrombectomy in acute stroke after mechanical thrombectomy failure. And they had only 53 patients around, uh, no, only 47 patients and only seven patients had a good uh, MRS scale. So maybe your experience, if you can publish, would become the largest in the world. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. uh, thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I also hope for the publishment of the uh, good result for the uh, direct embryectomy series. So it's very preferable to comparison between the embryectomy in the even in the history cases in, in compared to the patient with the uh, to the transcatheter embryectomy the cases the comparison is very important. Yeah, I thank want to much. want to know about results. Thank you. I will try. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Oh, I can see uh, Doctor Joey Sam also raised uh, his hands. Maybe we could ask uh, those same thank you, for thank you, ben. opinion. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Professor Kimura. Thank you, Professor Ono. Um, very fantastic lecture. I'm very, very impressed. And I hope one day I can achieve what you have achieved. Uh, I have two burning questions I would like to ask you. Uh, first, for the embolectomy, you did a transverse uh, incision. Uh, is there any benefit compared to a longitudinal uh, incision? Uh, that, that is uh, my first question. And uh, for beginners who have not seen many basilatip uh, aneurysm clipping, what, what are the things that you would advise us to look out for uh, and to prepare before we start uh, doing the particular surgery to avoid complications which normally occur with beginners? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Um, in the embryectomy, uh, transverse cutting, we prefer transverse cutting because the longitudinal uh, cutting make the uh, vessel uh, thinner. And after longitudinal That's cutting, then yeah, uh, a suture is um, smaller. That's That's the diameter of the uh, vessel is smaller. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yes. Uh, Thank you. And the next question, and so recently the endovascular surgery is, uh, the cases of em uh, endovascular surgery is uh, rising, um, getting more and more. So maybe young neurosurgeons uh, have less, less chances doing clipping than before. 
So um, we have to learn and uh, we have to run well in uh, with less cases. So in recent years, we can learn from the web seminar like this and uh, uh, some kind of uh, operation on the web. So we learn, we see those videos and, uh, and, and the study. So one point. And next point is uh, and the microsurgical practice uh, as shown in this um in this pre in my presentation using the some kind of uh, chicken wing uh gauze gauze fiber uh, the demonstrating the operation before the actual surgery is very important i think and um, actually in my uh, when i was young i i go other uh, hospitals to see the operations actually uh so um, please study a lot and uh, good. Please do a good operation. So, ですね。あの、高さとかあるいはあのアプローチサイドだとかですね。はい。多分そんなようなことを術前にどうやって見極めたらいいかってことを聞いてみます。ああ、そういうそういうことなんですね。でも入ってるところ。わかりました。あ、
And uh, recently, the, uh, post, in the post, uh, posterior circulation aneurysms, the endovascular surgery cases uh, is getting uh, more. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, that's, I'm uh, Dr. Ahmad Fawad Pirzad from Afghanistan, Afghanistan Neurosurgical Society. Thank you. Thank uh, you very much. Arigatou gozaimasu. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Chris. And also, I can see uh, Professor uh, Olesen uh, here. Maybe we can also hear a uh, comment. Uh, thank from you. The professor. Thank you, Boon. Uh, Professor Ono, thank you very much for excellent presentation. It's really up to date, uh, more than my vascular micro neurosurgery. You uh, showed almost the, everything. And I'm really impressed. Thank you very much. Uh, as a commenter, I would like to start from <clears throat> uh, surgical approaches you use. And I, I absolutely agree with you that the size of craniotomy doesn't matter. If a uh, big craniotomy is performed uh, uh, appropriately, it doesn't mean that you are more aggressive and you are more, it's more traumatic for patients. So surgeon performed it. Craniotomy, adequate craniotomy to, to feel absolutely safe for himself, uh, safe for, for the patient. Also, the tailored uh, craniotomy is also very important for more complex cases, uh, vascular and tumor cases. So uh, it's my comment concerning uh, craniotomy. And I have uh, also, I noticed that you use uh, brain retractors. I think it's uh, also good practice because uh, Having a brain retractor uh, is very important, and it sometimes it helps very much if you have it. And then uh, I, I noticed that you use the retractor only on the absolutely relaxed brain. It's very important, and thank you for this. That you, you do not retract; you just hold the, the brain. Yes, uh, yes. yes so. That's great, it's because I'm a commenter, so I make some comments for young for young and neurosurgeons. So I notice it; it's really great that you do not do not retract the brain uh, <coughs> by, by the pulling or pushing it. You just hold it, move it without any traumatization. So it's, it's, thank you very much for this. Also, uh, I noticed that. Uh, it seems to me that uh, at the time of clipping, uh, the aneurysm will look quite soft. On what blood uh, at blood pressure do you perform clipping? Uh, blood uh, patients' blood, blood pressure do you perform clipping? Do you do you decrease it or, or no? To, to what level? Uh, no, no, actually, uh, not uh, the same. No, 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 no. Okay, um, but okay. Rupture, rupture the cases and uh, the blood pressure lower. Well, in blood, of course. When, when, yes, okay. Thank you very much. And one more question about timing for um, timing for um, trump, uh, open trump, trump extraction, open uh, thrombectomy. Is this the same as for endovascular procedure or you just uh, let you be, extend the time of uh, procedure for procedure for trump extraction? Uh oh, excuse timing, me. Timing for. Uh, timing, timing, oh, timing is that. Yeah. Yes. Timing is that. Um, same. The same, the same window. The same, same. window as for, for endovascular. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great presentation. Attention. Uh, uh, great presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And see, Dr. Islam raised up his hand. You have some question for. Uh, Professor Ono. Yeah, yeah. I'm here, Professor. Uh, can I uh, ask two questions? Hello, please, please, can you hear please. me? Yes, yes. Yes, we can. Yeah. Thank you, Professor, for your brilliant presentation. Uh, I am a neurosurgeon from Bangladesh, uh, and now I am doing fellowship in Fuzidah University. In my country, most of the patients present with ruptured one, and sometimes there is extensive sourdough hemorrhage, and hunt and his grade is sometimes poor. And the main problem we face during post-operative period that we lose some patients due to vasospasm, in spite of big, taking all measures to 
keep pressure high. So uh, what tips uh, you will give us regarding to prevent this spasm? And mm -hmm. my second question is, some patients developed communicating hydrocephalus, and in those patients, we put a baby shunt. Is it okay or uh, you have some other tips? Thank you. Thank you. No. Uh, My first question is to uh, techniques, techniques, tips to prevent basic spasm. 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 Okay, thank you. As you mentioned, yeah. Uh, yeah. spasm is a uh, very difficult problem, and uh, in the direct surgery, uh, it is very difficult to uh, lower the possibility of the spasm, and uh, we, I consider that the. I, we can, what we can do to prevent spasm is only the hydration of the hematoma, uh, removing the clot as, as much as possible. So uh, in the operation, uh, we, uh, we irrigate and uh, uh, remove the clot as much as possible to uh, make the better surgical field. And that is, uh, that is also uh, to reduce the uh, possibility of the spasm. Okay, thank you. And uh, some patients develop postulative uh, communicating hydrocephalus, and yes. we, yeah, and we put a prevention in those cases. Mm -hmm. Do you do the same, or uh, you have another technique? Uh, okay, uh, we connect same with uh, prevention. Yeah, thank you. And my final final question is: Sometimes we give papaverin osh uh -huh. uh, per per operative. Uh, do we uh, use papaverin or pap uh, papaverin? Uh, okay. Uh, no. In in our operation, we use uh, papaverin well. Uh, it is not. Uh, it is uh, in the rupture case. It and a rupture case. We use papaverin. And okay. after the operation in our hospital, we use the uh, irrigation using the uh, drain, two drains, the cisternal drains and ventricular drains, and uh, irrigate the clot well for two or three days. And in the possibility of spasm. Okay. And in, in rupture cases, do you open the laminar terminalis in all cases? Uh, no. No, no, no. no. Uh, in the in the ICA aneurysm, we grip and after the gripping, we uh, open the really kissed membrane and um, make the connection of the anterior and the posterior circulation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you so much. I can see there are three questions in the chat box and we have already discussed about the use of the retractors and also uh, the laminar uh, terminalis. One last question in the chat box is about the use of the adrenaline, uh, at the use of the adenosine at the time of the keeping. Do you use uh, adenosine at the time of the keeping, Professor Ono? Adenosine to bring the temporary arrest. Adenosine is called mascot. Adeno, ah, no, uh, we don't use. Thank you. Uh, yes, maybe we, we if we don't have uh, further question, maybe shall I invite uh, Professor Kimura to introduce our second speakers? Okay. Thank you, Professor. I was so impressed about your again. Thank you. Congratulations for your excellent surgical series. I'm looking forward to next cases to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Who is, who is raising hand? Oh, who I can is? see a Dr. Raman is raising your hands. Yes, uh, good day, sir. And uh, thank you, Professor Hideki, for your excellent presentation. And I have seen you have dissected uh, very much beautifully. Uh, with a sharp description technique. And even after such a beautiful technique, uh, do you have any experience of post clipping vessels puzzle? In that case, uh, how do you manage post clipping vessels puzzle? 
And another question is, um, I have uh, uh, seen some cases of ruptured acom aneurysm, but the blood is mostly in the interhemispheric space above the corpus callosum. And to prevent vasospasm, we must need to remove the hematoma. And each such cases, what is your approach, surgical approach? Patient has ruptured acom aneurysm, but blood is in the interhemispheric space above the corpus callosum. Thank you. Uh, excuse me for first question is okay. my first question is even after such beautiful dissection, do dissection. you have any experience of post ah. clipping vessels puzzle? And in ah. that case, how do you prevent? Uh -huh. um, the possibility uh, spasm. The possibility of the spasm is an. Uh, Mm, about uh, uh, twenty percent. About twenty percent. And okay. uh, how do you treat uh, the spasm in such cases? Uh, spasm. Uh, we use the uh, as I mentioned before the um, irrigation of the irrigation using the two drains and uh, doing is not not special. <laughs> Maneuver we conduct uh, spasm treatment as as normal treatment. Mm. Uh, uh, I'm asking uh, this question because right the, now. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, I'm sorry for interruption. I'm asking this question because I, I work in Dhaka Medical College. Uh, this is a government hospital in Bangladesh, and right now we have a patient. Uh, uh, he was kept for M's ruptured MC aneurysm. Three days back, yeah, first post, two postoperative day, patient was fine. But uh, in the third postoperative day, patient had uh, vessel spasm. So we took the patient to cath lab and uh, we uh, injected nemodipin in the MC by endovascular technique because we have a cath lab. And the patient was fine. And uh, initial days showed severe vessel spasm, but after a nemodipin injection, uh, vessel spasm was relieved. Patient was fine, but at the next day, patient again developed vessel spasm. And how to deal with such patient? Because we keep the pressure high, uh, and we also use uh, noradrenaline to keep the pressure high. Still, patient developed vessel spasm. How to deal with such cases? Uh, it is very difficult. I think uh, we can do is the. Uh, as you mentioned, and uh, cisternal uh, nemodipine use and the blood pressure and uh, sodium and uh, have uh, like normal normal control. Yeah. Okay. So and then, okay. and uh, second second question. Okay. Approach or uh, yeah. in the in the ruptured uh, anterior communicating artery aneurysm cases, um, what is most uh, important is the uh, clip the aneurysm safely, securely is the most important point I think. So in that from that aspect, uh, we uh, con we decide the approach. Uh, terrional or uh, interhemispheric, which is more safely, more securely clip the aneurysm. Not, uh, not, uh, not the, hema the amount of the hematoma. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Can I allow me a short, give you a short comment for the vasospasm? In, in Japan, we we, uh, we sometimes use uh, antiplatelet drugs, so of course, cirostazole. So maybe effective for to prevent uh, vasospasm. In Japan, we can use that uh, drugs. So recently, you know, the Kratos, Kratosentan and uh, anti, uh, uh, sorry, and uh, Kratosentan. Yes, 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 and endothelial drugs, yes, uh, 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 commercially available drugs. But before that, uh, the volume, high, a little bit high volume may be very important to keep the patient uh, high a little bit uh, high volume level. And of course, the blood pressure kept normal, not, never 
below the blood pressure, low blood pressure, very important is, is of, of course there. Yeah, thank you. After that, after the bus was occurred, as you mentioned, repeated uh, and transcatheter nimazepine in infusion is repeated daily, 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 daily. You have to do <laughs> the prevention is very important, as you as you think. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, next, so let's move on to the next session, next speaker. Uh, I welcome to Professor Ricardo Ramina. He is our uh, professor and the chairman of the Neurosurgical Department, Neurosurgical Institute of Curitiba, Brazil. His topic is surgery of rash and giant vestibular sure normas. Thank you, Professor. Please give your comment, start your presentation if you are ready. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning to everybody. Good evening to everybody. I like to share my, my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Oh, that's good. Many thanks for the invitation. I like to thank very much uh, Professor uh, uh, Yoko Kato and uh, for this invitation. That's the second time I participate in this uh, meeting. It's a very interesting meeting. You can discuss many uh, very interesting points. Today, I like to uh, share with you our experience with the large and giant vestibular schwannomas. Uh, how we approach it, how you treat these patients, and uh, the uh, results of our case. We are in South America, in South Brazil, very far away from Japan, but uh, that's very nice because we have now the possibility of a connection between all the globe, and that's very important for education. Curitiba is a large city, we have 3 million people here, most of the people living here are descendants from Italian, Germans, Poles, and Japanese. Uh, in this presentation, there is nothing to disclose. And our center in uh, South Brazil uh, is uh, uh, a center for education for uh, Brazilian and also for foreigners, uh, neurosurgeons. We uh, have also a residence program for the uh, uh, WFNS five years program residence and or have fellowships also. When we talk about management of vestibular schwannoma, we have three options, observation, surgery, and radio surgery. Uh, we use the classification of magic sunny and we have modified it. Uh, magic sunny uh, has a classification of T1 to T4. We have uh, added to this classification T0, that's the intralabyrinthine uh, tumors, uh, and also we modify the T1 uh, tumors, the T1A, T1B, I will explain a little bit about that, the small tumors, and also uh, the giant residual recurrent tumors. I like that's a special uh, class, a special group of tumors we have to discuss. That's our experience in this time, this period of time. Uh, 719 case, and uh, the most cases are large tumors, T4A, T4D, and giant case, and also we have uh, 36 uh, large uh, and giant residual recurrent tumors. All these patients have been operating in other centers and sent to us to reoperate and to remove the tumor. T0 tumors are those small tumors uh, and intravestibular, uh, very uh, modular, uh, modular tumors, and that's not the focus of our presentation today. We uh, modified the classification uh, of T1 and have published it now in uh, uh, Journal of Neurosurgery. We classify T1A and T1B tumors. T1A are those tumors arising uh, behind the nerves. And uh, T1B tumors are those uh, arising between the nerves. That makes a big difference. We have published recently in the Journal of Neurosurgery our results. And these T1B 
are much difficult to preserve here in these patients. What are the goals of treatment? We are talking today about T4A and B and large and recurrent tumors. Our goal is radical remove and obtain cure with no mortality, facial nerve preservation, and hearing preservation is very difficult in this group of the patient. Uh, in T1A, you can preserve, uh, we are able to preserve in some case, but T4B and large recurrent tumors, uh, in our experience, it was not possible to uh, preserve hearing. How about the surgical approach? We use, in all cases, we have sigma transmitter approach. I have used in, my, in the past translabyrinthine, uh, middle fossa, mini, uh, mini protons approach. But today, I'm convinced that the red sick uh, transmitter approach is very uh, good for every kind of tumor of the shibular uh, schwannoma, even the, the large one or the small one, because we have a lot of advantage of using this. Uh, when you use the red sick uh, transmitter approach, the advantage will have a wide exposure we have a perfect control of the posterior fossa structures. We can preserve hearing. We can reconstruct the facial nerve. We can close the dura. <clears throat> That's a very short time needed to open, to uh, perform this approach. Usually you need uh, uh, half an hour to open and to perform the approach. And it's uh, suitable for all tumor size. Uh, some disadvantage the people are <clears throat> taught, telling uh, and comparing with the translapyrinthine, that, that's an uh, intradural, but we neurosurgeons are operating every day intradural. The exposure of the uh, fundus of the internal auditory canal is very good with this uh, red sigm approach. And there is no cerebral retraction because we open the cistern. Uh, usually uh, this uh, operation, uh, we take two hours to four and a half an hours, uh, in, uh, depending on the size of the tumor. How about the position of the patient? Uh, we are using uh, supine, uh, the mastoid position. I was trained in Hanover. I was seven years with Majid Sami and used to operate all these cases in the same sitting position. But I modified when I arrived to Brazil and use the supine approach because I think it's, uh, uh, it's a little bit better for the patient, uh, even for the, nurse, uh, for, for the surgeon. The lateral park bench approach you can use also and the ventral approach uh, if the patient has some tumors and the cranial cervical junction. That's for NF2 cases, very good. The semi-sitting position has some advantage. There is less uh, CSF and blood in the surgical field, uh, reduce the venous bleeding, and it's making a little bit easier the cranial nerve dissection. But it's not so good for the surgeon. The position of the surgeon is, is quite uh, uh, difficult. There is a higher risk of air embolism, the postoperative venous bleeding, epineurocephalus. And for an uh, elder patient, uh, some hemodynamic instability. The supine approach, in our opinion, has uh, a lot of uh, advantage. It's a lower risk of air embolism and postoperative venous bleeding, pneumocephalus. The position of the uh, surgeon is very comfortable. And the tumor dissection, the internal auditory canal, is, in our opinion, very good to do. Uh, some disadvantage of this uh, position is uh, the presence of CSF and blood in the surgical field, but you get accustomed to it very, very easily. And uh, some uh, the dissection of the cranial nerves at brainstem is a little bit difficult. We should be careful in the position to avoid uh, arterial uh, vertebral artery compression. That's the position we use in uh, almost all patients and uh, the skin incision, that's a small the skin incision about uh, four centimeters from the ear and six centimeters in the length. Uh, we use neural navigation in every case to localize the sinus and intraoperative monitoring all the patients. Uh, we localize the asterion, but the asterion is not uh, always uh, the junction of the, uh, uh, the sinus. 
then we should use uh, more and more uh, the navigation to avoid injury of the sinus. That's uh, we prefer, uh, prefer, uh, prefer to perform a craniotomy, it's not craniectomy, because you can reconstruct anatomically much better and reduce postoperative headaches in this patient. Uh, in some uh, patients, uh, it's uh, more difficult to perform a crani craniotomy in elderly patients, but in navigation, you can avoid uh, injury of the sinuses. The second, and then we open the dura parallel to the sigmoid sinus. You can see here, that's a, a incision we use parallel to sinus. And then very important is to dissect the uh, cerebellomedullary system to release CSF uh, liquor. And then you, you see that there is no retraction. You don't need to restrict the direction. You can operate in some case without any uh, uh, spatula, any retraction, just to protect the cerebellum. Next very important point is to dissect the uh, arachnoid plane because uh, all the structures will be protected by this uh, very thin arachnoid membrane. That's what we do. We dissect the arachnoid plane. You can see very nicely. You should be careful with the coagulation of uh, veins because veins, uh, you can have some uh, problems, some trouble with uh, uh, venous infection, especially with the dense vein. Uh, if the dense vein is uh, compressed by the large tumor, uh, it's already occluded, okay. But the smaller tumor should be careful, take a look at the tentorial and uh, avoid uh, coagulation or injury of the dentist's uh, band. We developed here uh, for many, many years ago, a uh, pedicle uh, dural flap to cover the nerves after removal of the tumor. We, uh, this flap remains uh, attached to the, the dura and the vascular eyes, and we use this uh, patch, uh, dura patch to, uh, uh, to uh, cover the nerves. That's how we do this flap. I can show you in a video right now. We open the internal auditory canal. We perform this uh, dural flap, vascularized dural flap. We elevate this flap from the bone. It will remain attached to the uh, uh, jugular foramen. And then we open the internal auditory canal. That's the... Uh, the standard way to open it in this position is you, you can see liquor, uh, flushing liquor every, uh, all the time. And then we open the canal and we use this flap to remove. Uh, in some cases, we should be careful uh, with the, the problem of the uh, uh, jugular above injury. Uh, especially for young people for uh, not experienced uh, uh, Surgeons should do not. That, that's a problem if you uh, uh, during drilling you open the uh, the uh, jugular bulb. You can see that's a case. This patient had a, a high jugular bulb. That's the jugular bulb. That's the craniotomy. And then what happened? What should you do if you open the uh, jugular bulb? What we do is put at first uh, 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 a cotton and uh, compress it and be calm. That's very important for the young people and then use a piece of muscle. But you should uh, not introduce the muscle inside of the sinus. You should just cover the open uh, uh, sinus. And then you uh, can continue the surgery. That's important because uh, sometimes the residents are performing this uh, drilling of the internal auditory canal. And if you encounter this bleeding, you should not uh, you should be very calm and use the muscle and then uh, cover the defect, but not occlude the signs. Muscle is very, very good. Fashion muscle is very good. And then uh, finding glue, you can uh, occlude the and continue the surgery. 
you can see at the end that remove the tumor. You, you can see that the, the sign was uh, not occluded. That's a small uh, piece of the muscle just uh, occluding this uh, opening of the, of the sinus. Very important is to uh, avoid fistula, CSF fistula. We have two kinds of fistula, internal fistula, it cells in the uh, internal auditory uh, canal or external the muscular cells. What you do, we use this flap to cover the nerves and use a small piece of muscle uh, to uh, cover all this uh, opening of the cells. Endoscope is very useful to see these open cells and fried blue. When this procedure reduces uh, dramatically the incidence of internal fistula. That's how we use this flap, this dural flap to cover the nerves and check with a small hook if there's some opening in the internal auditory canal cells. That's important to avoid CSF fistula. Then we use small piece of muscle to cover all these cells, open cells, and also endoscopy. And what's very more, a very important use is small piece of muscle at first, and then a large one to cover all these open cells. And the mastoid cells, uh, we open it, we use uh, bony wax, muscle, and fiber glue. That's uh, important to, to cover all these cells and avoid CSF, postoperative CSF fistula. Facial nerve, we have the possibility of direct uh, electric stimulation. In all case, we perform the uh, death, continuous electromyography and facial uh, motor evoked potation. That's very important to preserve the facial nerve. The facial nerve is identified uh, within the uh, internal auditory canal. And then we follow the arachnoid plane and uh, perform intracapsular debulking. Uh, at the entrance of the internal auditory canal, the facial nerve is very thin. Should be careful to dissect in that portion of the, uh, the, the, the uh, facial nerve. And uh, removal of the uh, cystic tumor and preserving the facial nerve is more difficult because uh, this is, uh, the uh, facial nerve sometimes is, is spread and it is, have more, uh, more than one fibers. <laughs> in some cases, the facial nerve can be uh, in the dorsal position. It's very rare, but we have some case. You can see uh, in the literature, very, very few cases have been reported. And that's a case in our uh, institution. You can see that's a large tumor. The facial nerve was dorsal. It's just how you open the regular way to open, dissect the arachnoid, yeah. and then you can see the, the facial nerve is dorsal. So that's the facial nerve. And there is tumor in front of the facial nerve. Yeah, there is the facial nerve and tumor in front of the facial nerve. There, uh, the facial nerve was dorsal to the tumor. That's a very uh, rare, but uh, what I recommended is always to stimulate this large tumor, the capsule of the tumor to check if the facial nerve is, uh, could be in the dorsal portion. And after a removal, complete removal of the tumor, you can see preservation of the facial nerve and a very good stimulation of the facial nerve at the brain stem. And stimulate it. That's a case how we do these uh, large tumors in this position. Look, there is no protection of the, the cerebellum. Let's open the uh, cerebellum medulla system, dissect the uh, arachnoid plane, use the cavitron. You can see here the fourth nerve, the caudal cranial nerves, the fifth nerves, and then open the internal auditory canal and dissect 
the facial nerve, in this case, was ventral to the tumor and remove completely the lesion with preservation of the facial nerve. We use endoscopy for checking the open cells. That's important. We use small piece of muscle to cover all the cells and avoid CSF history. Some example of this uh, uh, large tumors, you can see here, this is a large tumor. And uh, six months after surgery, the facial nerve was a great two to three. The patient recovered very well. That's another case, large one. And the patient two days after surgery after radical removal. That's a, a patient, a young patient, a very large tumor. That's the first day after surgery, has some uh, grade three to four facial palsy. And two years after the postoperative uh, removal of the tumor, the, there is a, a grade one to two facial palsy. <clears throat> That's another one. In some cases, this uh, vestibular schwannoma have uh, brain edema, brain stem edema. You can see that's a difficult, some, sometimes difficult to preserve the nerve because you have already this edema uh, compressing the tumor is compressing the brain stem and causing edema. But even in this case, you can remove completely the tumor and preserve the facial nerve. That's three days after surgery, and then this patient, this patient recovered to grade uh, one to two after some months. But now I like to uh, uh, talk to you about this uh, kind of tumor, the large and giant residual recurrent tumors. That are uh, the most difficult case in my opinion, because this tumor, this patient had been operated before and all our cases in other uh, departments, they uh, operate this case, but it did not remove the tumor. And then we see this patient uh, to treat. Recurrent uh, vestibular schwannomas uh, are com uh, completely different from uh, the uh, virgin tumors that did no, not operated before. In some series published uh, 1,000 cases uh, in 1997, it uh, published uh, 62 recurrent tumors. 50, uh, 56 were operated in other departments. The size of these tumors were not reported. But in this series, two patients died after surgery for a recurrent tumor. Mm -hmm. Gomblin and Shaker published 179 uh, patients uh, operated cases and 11 recurrent tumor. And Mario Sana uh, reported uh, 23 recurrent cases, but only a four uh, large lesions and one giant, only five large or giant. And uh, two patients presented uh, preoperative facial palsy. And radical removal was possible in four or five. But the facial nerve could not be preserved in any case. That uh, shows the difficulty of this group of the patient. And our case will have 37 cases of large and giant residual recurrent tumors. All these patients have been operated elsewhere. <laughs> elsewhere. We have 19 females and 18 males, but uh, most of the patients are young patients. You can see here a young patient. All patients were deaf before surgery. 15 patients presented already a facial nerve palsy, and nine patients with caudal nerves palsy. 16 patients with hydrocephalus, and seven patients have been uh, submitted to a uh, radiotherapy or radio surgery. And the question is why these tumors became or remained large or giant after surgery? Uh, one, the surgeon did not inform the patient that the removal was not complete. That's uh, in Brazil, we can see, and probably in other countries, uh, the same. This, the patient is operated, but the surgeons are not informing the patient. Uh, or the patient had postoperative complication and the patient and surgeon uh, are afraid of a new approach to uh, the removal of the tumor. That's a different surgery because we have a lot of scars, cystic formation, everything is attached. Um, do the uh, previous surgery, you can see some cystic formation. The nerves are uh, attached to the tumor capsule. 
especially if the patient has been irradiated before. And the tumor is much more harder than the uh, other one. It's more difficult to dissect these tumors. Here are some cases. This patient has been operated before in other center for uh, through the uh, red sigmoid approach. And you can see the small section of the tumor and after re complete removal of the tumor in our institution. That's another case, one uh, previous surgeon, uh, after radical removal and preserving the facial nerve. Same patient, nine years after surgery, you can see there is no recurrence tumor and the facial nerve is, is uh, preserved grade one, Hausenbrachman. That's another case, it's been operated on in Argentina. That's a small, you can see that it's small removal of the tumor and the patient presented uh, after this first surgery, facial nerve palsy. Then remove totally uh, tumor uh, at ink. That's a, a case, uh, this patient was operated before and uh, uh, went to us uh, after the first surgery in another uh, clinic, was in coma, uh, showed the hemiplegia, deafness, facial nerve palsy, over nerve palsy, and tracheostomy. You can see what remained the tumor, it's a large one. And then we could remove radically this tumor. That's the MRI three days after surgery. And here, four years after surgery, we reconstruct the facial nerve. And the patient uh, recover very well from the ataxia, from any, any uh, plagia. This case, the patient had two previous surgery, and you can see the remain tumor. And you ask what the people uh, did. They removed just a little bit of the tumor, and that's what we received, very large tumor. And here you can see 10 years after surgery, radical removal was possible. And this case was operated in Argentina, three uh, previous surgery, and that's the remaining tumor. And after the radical removal, uh, the patient is uh, doing very well, is working as a pharmacist in Buenos Aires. This girl, 21 year old female, before surgery, she had this tumor. And after the first surgery, it was uh, a surgery performed in Lima, Peru, uh, they uh, need eight hours uh, to remove this small piece of tumor and a lot of bleeding. They perform a second surgery and remove a little bit more of the tumor. And then we operate this patient uh, in Curitiba. We need four hours to remove it in no transfusion. You can see the patient three months after surgery and uh, three years after surgery. But the worst scenario of these uh, tumors are uh, those patients who had been operated and irradiated. That's the case. That's a young lady when this large tumor had been operated twice before uh, coming to us and irradiated. She was in a wheelchair and had a bubble kind of nerve palsy and complete facial nerve palsy. We remove the tumor, we form a revascular a reconstruction of the facial nerve. And nowadays she's a teacher uh, in the uh, real school. That's another case. That's a, a young female, 34 year old, two previous surgery and radio surgery. You can see the remaining tumor compressing the brain stem. And the difficulty in this case is to remove. She has also a, a, a hydrocephalus and a, 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 a valve, and then a complete removal of this lesion. This female, 50 year old, had four radio surgery and radio surgery, and went to us with complete facial nerve palsy, ataxia, bulb nerve palsy, and tracheostomy. You can see the remaining tumor compressing the brainstem, and then we could remove completely this, uh, this lesion and the patient is recovering. 
That's a young lady, 33 year old, in two previous surgery and radiotherapy. Uh, look at the, uh, the brainstem edema in this case. It was a very, very difficult case because of this edema after uh, irradiation. Then we perform, uh, so, uh, that's the only case in our series we did in, in two, uh, uh, two steps surgery. <clears throat> At first step, there uh, was a large edema of the brainstem and then we reduce the tumor as much as possible <clears throat> and give the patient the chance for some months to recover from this edema and then he operated the patient. That's uh, three months after uh, the first operation at, at our institution, we removed the tumor and uh, the brainstem uh, reduced. And then you did the surgery, the complete surgery with the complete removal of the tumor. You can see the facial nerve, you show the facial nerve was very, very thin in this case. That's the facial nerve. And even in this case, with such a difficulty, you can preserve the facial nerve. Here's the removal of the tumor, and that's the facial nerve. Very thin facial nerve in this case. That's the brain stem. You can see here the facial nerve, the trigeminal nerve, and the, how the tumor is attached to this structure after surgeries, after radiotherapy. Very important is always to dissect the arachnoid plane. And then you can see at the end the facial nerve and a radical removal of the tumor. Here, four months after surgery and resolution of the uh, brain uh, edema. That's before surgery, uh, upper and lower. Uh, you can see resolution of the brain stem edema. And that's the patient four months after surgery. It's a recovery for the facial nerve palsy. Our results, <clears throat> tumor size in this series, uh, 37 case. We have 23 giant case, 10 T4B, uh, 4 T4A. The facial nerve uh, was preoperatively preserved in 21 case, the postoperative in 16 case. We could preserve 76% of the patient. And we have a postoperative bulbar cranial nerve, all in three cases. And uh, total removal was performed in all these patients. We have three CSF leaks and no mortality in this uh, difficult case. That's our sales of results of our sales. If you see the smaller tumors, T1, T2, T3, uh, we could preserve the facial nerve in 100% of the patient. That's why we don't uh, use radio surgery for this case. That's uh, the ideal case for radio surgery, but we don't use it, don't uh, indicate it because surgery, uh, in my opinion, is much better because you can cure the patient. In uh, large tumors, we can preserve the facial nerve. And in most cases, you see here uh, T4A, we could preserve in 92% of the case the facial nerve. And in most cases, is uh, a very good preservation of the facial nerve. And how about hearing? In my experience, I can preserve hearing in T1 in uh, about 65% of the case, but in T this large tumor is much lower. It's uh, almost difficult, almost impossible for me to preserve in this giant tumors uh, hearing. Uh, CSF leak, uh, we have very few CSF leak, 1%. We had four cases of mortality, and no mortality in the last uh, 30, uh, 250 case. Cause of this mortality was one hematoma, two basilar artery infarction. In one patient had giant bilateral ENF2 tumors and had developed postoperative complication and uh, 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 pneumonia, pneumonia and infection. And total removal of in our series was possibly 99% of the cases. We had four recurrence in our series. And all these patients were operated and cured. Causes of uh, 
subtotal removal was a giant in F2. One after a, a gamma knife, a small tumor, the patient had no uh, facial, uh, facial nerve intact, and uh, elderly patient in two cases. What to do with facial nerve palsy after surgery? If you could preserve the nerve, uh, I like to wait at least 12 months, and the majority of the patient recover very well. If you, uh, the, the nerve is lost, we perform a tarsography and put a gold weight and perform uh, uh, anastomosis, uh, seven to seven anastomosis, the best to do, or uh, hypoglossal facial anastomosis. That's uh, uh, a technique we're using, a uh, terminal lateral anastomosis uh, with hypoglossus nerve. You can see the postoperative result with uh, the tongue, the function of the tongue is preserved if you use this uh, uh, terminal lateral. And that's the case we perform uh, anastomosis at the brainstem. You can see the results are quite good. It's uh, grade one to two, 10 years after surgery. And uh, some words about uh, radio surgery. We have a uh, radio surgeon in our institution, uh, gamma knife uh, perfection then it's very easy for us to indicate radio surgery for such case and for other case. But how about the results of that? That's a very interesting paper published by the uh, group in, uh, from Tokyo, uh, showing a uh, compared uh, radio surgery in young and elderly patients. And the group are almost the same, and the results uh, are very interesting. If you see the tumor control rate uh, was quite good, uh, but in the younger paper, uh, patient, if you see the 15 years follow-up uh, uh, tumor control rate is uh, going down to 85%. Uh, it's uh, worse than uh, surgical cells. It's uh, the my series much better uh, to control because uh, we remove complete the tumor. Facial and trigeminal nerve function in these areas. If you see the older cohort, 12.6% uh, uh, had some deficit of facial nerve after surgery, after radio surgery, and 9.6% trigeminal nerve deficit. And the young group is, uh, is worse, is uh, facial nerve 20.4%. and 14.3% of trigeminal nerve deficit. That's worse than the surgical series. How about hearing preservation, the rate of surgery? If you see the cumulative uh, hearing preservation rates, you see that it's going down. And after 10 years, uh, almost one third of the patient remain on hearing. Uh, in surgery, if you preserve the hearing, in T1, T2, T3 patients, uh, you can, this preservation of the hearing is, is remained for many, many, many years. And in this area, they presented uh, also two patients, 4.5% in the younger group, uh, had developed malignant peripheral nerve tumors after radio surgery. If you see the series, the literature about uh, preservation, about tumor control in larger tumors, uh, larger than uh, 2.5 centimeters in the posterior fossa, you see that this control is going down. And then uh, if you have a young patient and you uh, perform radio surgery for this kind of tumors, probably you uh, lose control in the years. How about complication of radio surgery? First, there is no cure. 100% of the patient remain with the tumor. And some of the patient will uh, grow again. If you see uh, tumors up to three centimeters, 80 to 80% uh, control of the tumor, but they can grow. Facial nerve preservation uh, is also uh, not so good in tumors, uh, in small tumors up to three centimeters. Here preservation is very good at, uh, at the beginning after radio surgery, but it's going down to 30% to 0%. Uh, some patients can develop 5% or can uh, develop 
hydrocephalus during surgery and trigeminal uh, nerve deficit. Uh, one infection is possible, but it's very rare. Uh, you can have some rare events like uh, edema uh, or motor deficit. And uh, malignization or secondary induced tumors, it's uh, unknown, but it's about uh, 0.5 to 1%, we don't know exactly. <laughs> we, we have to follow this patient for the rest of their life with MRI control. And there is no histological diagnosis in this case. In conclusion, uh, in these large and giant tumors, uh, also the lion giant re recurrent tumors, resection is uh, more difficult than the small one. If the tumor, uh, patient was operated before, it's much uh, difficult because of scar tissue. If there is no clear arachnoid plane. The vessels, the nerves, and the brainstem are compressed and displaced. But surgery <clears throat> is the only treatment for this lesion. And complete resection is possible with low morbidity, mortality. And preservation of the seventh nerve is uh, a challenge, but it's possible also in these large cases. I thank you very much for your attention, and I'd like to discuss if you have some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Raminer. You showed us a very excellent surgical outcome for even in the large and the so large giant acoustic schwannoma while preserving the facial nerve. So high rate, high freaking high preservation rate of the facial nerve. So fantastic surgical cases. So, and uh, you compare to your surgical cases with the, the gamma knife treated patient, the, we understood the efficacy of the surgical removal for the acoustic tumor, for the, especially for the giant and the large tumor. So thank you for your excellent presentation. So, there may be a several kind of questions. So I will give you a short comment. So a short question for Professor Lamina. May I? So how can you, you the, we should the, to read, read precisely for the Siamese book, of course, but the, in, in, summary, in summary, what is the key point to preserve the facial nerve in the, even in the large cases? Thank you. Yes, that's a very important uh, question because uh, preservation of the facial nerve is fundamental in this surgery because uh, very often these patients are very young patients and we have to preserve the facial nerve. What do you do? If you can open the internal auditory canal uh, at, uh, as first step, it's very good because you localize the nerve always in the internal auditory canal. Uh, it's always there. There's no problem in that. And then, uh, but if you cannot do, you can remove the tumor, debulk the tumor, and look for the nerve at the brain stem. Should be careful, be very careful, and stimulate the capsule of the tumor because this nerve can be displaced upwards, downwards, on either uh, uh, dorsal portion of the nerves. And then dissect the nerve from the brain stem, and at the entrance of the internal auditory canal, it's the most difficult point. What I do in this case, we have, uh, I like to uh, 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 remove the tumor from the uh, upper uh, part of the internal auditory canal or from the, uh, the, uh, uh, the other part of the internal auditory canal, lower part. And then you can mobilize this nerve uh, in this region. But you should always uh, do uh, a stimulation and uh, doing the surgery. Mm. You do you use a continuous stimulation for the patient nerve interoperatively? Continuous. Yes. Yes. Uh, it's, it's smaller tumor is, is, is much easier. Mm -hmm. And uh, I use also in some case, if you have uh, some uh, discharge uh, in the monitorization, I irrigate the uh, papave. It's very interesting because uh, at that moment, it uh, stop this discharge, probably because of the vascular uh, effect of the papave. Thank you. Thank you. Very, uh, very educational message for us. Thank you. So, Dr. Ben, Dr. Ben. Okay. Yes. Uh, 
thank you. Uh, thank you, Rick, uh, Professor Ricardo, for your very educational um, uh, 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 lectures. And it's uh, very important to young surgeon and carry uh, so many important points. My question is about the management of the post-operative um, facial left palsy. So I can see that uh, you have uh, performed uh, facial reanimation procedures. So my question is that uh, usually how long would you wait uh, to to um, to consider doing the surgery? And uh, would you perform any electrophysiological studies, for example, ENOG, before you consider the, um, uh, uh, the reanimation? This is the first question. The second question is about the technique. I can saw that you, um, you for your reanimation, you have um, uh, several sites you uh, you can uh, perform at the Bingham uh, aspect. I, I guess that's the that's the uh, moments that you suspect uh, the facial left is uh, transected during the surgery, and then you perform the anastomosis. My concern is about uh, when you are doing the uh, the hypocausal facial reanimation. So uh, would you um, uh, we uh, would you reanimate both frontal and um, and uh, and the buccal branches? Or you just do the buccal punches uh, to uh, avoid this uh, synangiosis. Uh, what's your opinion, Professor? Thank you so much. Thank you for the question. Uh, first, uh, after surgery, if the patient has a facial palsy, what do you do? You should be careful because of a uh, corneal uh, ulcers. And then we have to protect the corneal of the patient. Uh, if the patient uh, has a complete palsy, usually we perform a tarsography to protect mm -hmm. or some lens. If you preserve very nicely the nerve, you can put uh, a lens, a, a lens to pr protect the corner for some uh, weeks and irrigate with uh, 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 some drops. That works very nicely. But if the uh, nerve was preserved, but uh, in not very good condition, or at the end of the surgery, you stimulate this nerve, it's not responding very well, but you preserve the nerve, then you perform a tarsography. If you uh, transect the nerve, you have two possibilities. The first one is uh, you have some cut of the nerve, some piece of nerve at the brain stem, then you can uh, take the sural nerve, or the uh, great auricular nerve and put a graft. That's mm. worked very nicely. And then perform a tarsography after immediately because you cut the nerve. Uh, it takes some uh, months, six months to initiate the recovery because the nerve is, uh, is going very uh, slowly, but you have very good results in this, in this technique. Uh, uh, but if you uh, have no cut, you have no piece of the nerve, you cannot localize anything more at the brainstem, then usually I perform a red vascularization of the facial nerve one week or 10 days after surgery. Mm. I prefer to use the uh, hypoglossal nerve. You can use also the mas mesenteric uh, branch of the uh, trigeminal nerve, but I prefer to use the hypoglossal nerve. But I'm not sexing, I'm not cutting the hypoglossal nerve. I'm performing the terminal lateral. <clears throat> I dissected the facial nerve in the mastoid portion and mm -hmm. rotated the facial nerve down and put a terminal lateral <clears throat> uh, because you perform the, uh, you preserve the tongue function and mm -hmm. it works very, very nicely. Mm -hmm. How about the uh, ENOG? Do you need to perform it uh, before your reanimation? Yes, that's a good question. In most cases, you can see the patient, you can examine the patient and see the facial nerve function. Mm. But after one year, uh, I wait at least one year, and there is no, really no function. Then what you do is uh, 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 I perform electrophysiological uh, uh, testing to see if there is some uh, recovery or not. Uh, the point is you can always... Uh, help the patient with the facial nerve, you can uh, pause it. You can always perform some technique, reconstruction or even plastic surgery if you really need it. Uh, uh, that's, that's good to say to the patient because I prefer, you, say, you have seen in my series that I prefer to radical removal than let a piece of uh, 
tumor with the facial nerve. I always prefer to radically remove the tumor. I, 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 the first thing for me is to cure the patient. If you mm -hmm. cure the patient, uh, it's the, the most important thing. If you cure the patient, then if you need, you can reanimate the facial nerve. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. This is a nice question. So next question from the audience. Do you have some? How about the Dr. Sam? Yeah. Dr. Sam, do you have some questions? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Kimura. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Ricardo. That's an excellent lecture. I'd just like to quickly ask, uh, I've had many patients in which uh, done surgery for vestibular schwannomas and post-operatively, the facial nerve is intact. It's very well seen. Uh, using EMG, we stimulate this uh, good function. However, post-operatively, immediately, it's house Bregman tree. Six months later, it's still house Bregman tree. One year later, it's still house Bregman tree. In these kind of cases, uh, is it a norm? Or would you perform any other treatment or is there uh, anything we can help the patients? Thank you. Yes, that's uh, it's interesting. What should you do in this case? Because if you uh, try to cut a nerve or some uh, odd procedure, probably the results are much worse. Uh, facial nerve can recover with the time. There is no time to say, uh, stop, it's not to recover anymore. Uh, that's very important to uh, talk to the, uh, uh, to the people, the, uh, to the physiotherapists people to recover the facial nerve. I usually to say the facial nerve has three functions. The first is the symmetry of the facial the of face. If you uh, see the patient, you can see there is uh, at first stage there is a, a symmetry. There is a, a complete facial uh, uh, palsy. After some time, uh, uh, the patient recovers the symmetry of the face. That's the first one. The second point is uh, recover of the uh, motor function. The patient want to close the eye or move the mouth, it can do, but you can see there is some pausing. And the third one is the emotional function because we are expressing our emotions through the face. And that's the most difficult because the patient has a, a great two or a great three function, but if he has he, or she has some emotion, you can see immediately there is a facial pausing. The way to correct that is to uh, train the patient uh, in front of a mirror. The patient can do it. Younger patients uh, do much better than the elder patient. But these three functions you can see after a false, uh, facial nerve palsy. All right. Th thank you so much, Professor. Thank you, Professor Ramina. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. The next question from the Dr. Azausu. As also, <laughs> thank you for waiting. Thank you. Please give thank us you. My, your question. Um, Professor Ramina, just uh, thank you for the presentation. It's very interesting. I have two questions. The first one is about the CSF leak. Uh, most probably you would do a revision to the surgery, but what if you didn't find a specific place for the CSF leak? Uh, and would you insert a lumbar drain? Uh, the second question is, uh, you've mentioned the case with NF2. Uh, and I'm pretty much sure that at least one of them was large enough. So uh, in this case, did you have um, a hard, secondary hydrocephalus with this case, uh, or maybe a cervical uh, schwannoma as well? Uh, so in this case, did you do you operate for a VP shunt or a direct attack? And if there is an additional associated cervical lesion on the NF2, would you operate the cervical before the schwannoma? Like the dilemma of NF2, which which one should you start first? Thank you. Good, that's good questions. Also, we have a, a large a large number of questions. Very interesting question. Uh, CSF leak. What do you do? Uh, we try to avoid it. That's the most important point. To try to avoid it, but it's not always possible. You cannot. Okay, it's not possible. We did everything you can do but you still have some CSF leak. Uh, at first, what you perform is a lumbar drainage. We let this lumbar drainage for two, three days. And if, if most of the cases, it's closed. You don't need to reoperate the patient. 
but uh, it's, it's uh, fail the, the work. What should you do? Two, two possibilities. The first one, the patient has a hearing. If this patient, we preserve hearing, and then we open the posterior fossa and close again the internal auditory canal. Second possibility, the patient has no hearing, or was not preserved the hearing. What to perform with our ELT colleagues, we go to the ear and close this uh, fistula to the ear and the uh, eustachian tube. That's uh, what, what you do. For NF2 patients, that's really a difficult, that's the most difficult case in this uh, disease, because very often you have patients with two large tumors, and one side you have hearing, or on the other side you have no hearing. Okay, you go at first the side with no hearing and remove the tumor. Sometimes you have a large tumor with hearing and a small one without hearing. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's a, a big difficult. What you perform in this case, at first, the age of the patient is important. Younger patient, what you do is to uh, remove as much as possible uh, with monitoring of the uh, uh, hearing function. If it's some uh, difficult, we just uh, remove in the bulk in the tumor. Engage uh, this patient bevacizumab, uh, uh, vesting for, uh, to control the hearing for some years, we know that the tumor will grow and the hearing will be lost, but you can at least preserve the tumor, uh, preserve hearing for uh, some years. And then you have the condition, the patient has small tumors, bilateral tumors with hearing. That's the best way to, to approach this uh, NF2 tumors. We remove the one side, and if you preserve hearing on one side, you open the you remove the other side. But if you're not, um, able to preserve the hearing one side, we just wait uh, for the other side. Thank you. Thank you. So here we are. I just want to have a comment from the Professor Alexander. Professor Alexander. Alexander. Yes, yes, I'm here. Thank you. you. Thank you, Professor Kimura. Thank you for mm -hmm. this possibility. Uh, Professor Ramina, thank you very much for great presentation for excellent surgery for uh, result for excellent results you presented in this surgery because it's really uh, tough surgery uh, difficult in, in all suspects mm. you know that uh, huge uh, vestibular schwannoma are very often associated with the uh, hydrocephalus so do you consider uh, the ventricular peritoneal shunting in some patient before surgery or you do, you do not perform it, so especially in patients who present uh, clinically presented with a hydrocephalic uh, clinic, um, not the brainstem clinic. Do you consider it? Yes. Uh, at, at the beginning, uh, we like to put a, uh, a ventricular drainage for some days three, four days, it is large uh, hydrocephalus and remove the tumor. But uh, in the last time, what we perform, in this case, to perform a shunt, I think it's much uh, it's safer if perform a shunt uh, two, three days before surgery, and then we relax the brain, we relax the posterior yes. fossa. And it's much better to dissect the nerve. Yes. That's my experience, what I am doing. But at the beginning, uh, even in Hanover, we put a, uh, we put a, a ventricular drainage at the beginning and wait uh, for the uh, uh, and operate the patient at the same time. But nowadays, I'm doing uh, a shunt before surgery. We do the same. Thank you. We do the same. And moreover, I have eight cases in uh, eight, eight elderly patients, more than 70 years old, which were not operated on, uh, uh, on uh, vestibular schwannoma because they are clinically absolutely intact uh, and uh, the tumors are stable. So I think you will, I presented it on, uh, at our conference. Maybe I will publish it. It's, it's really, it's, it's marvelous. Uh, my another question is concerning the preoperative MRI. You know that uh, the, in the recent publication, maybe 10 years back, 
there is a big discussion <clears throat> about uh, prediction of uh, tumor cons cons consistency uh, on the MRI da data and uh, about um, the tensor investigation uh, for location of the cranial nerves around the tumor. Uh, how do you think? Is it really so feasible for a neurosurgeon? Is it so useful for a neurosurgeon in practice uh, or not? What is your option? Yes, I think it's, uh, it's feasible. We have published a paper on that, uh, mm -hmm. localized facial nerve, uh, published in, uh, I think, in, in Journal of Neurosurgery or ACTA Neurosurgical some years ago. And uh, that's possible. We have to uh, in, uh, stimulate our neuroradiologists to mm -hmm. make better and better image for us and to give more and more information about the position of the nerve, about the extension of the tumor inside of the internal auditory canal and the consistency of the tumor. Uh, consistency of the tumor is important because we have sometimes very soft tumors and the capsule is also very thin and soft. It's, it's much difficult if you have a good capsule. And uh, I'm working with my uh, neuroradiologist to have more and more information preoperatively, but it's mm -hmm. good. I think in the future, we can do it. We can do more and more this tensor uh, image for the nerves. Okay. And about the elderly patients, it's, uh, I agree with you. And we are operating uh, elderly patients over the year, over 70. We are publishing a paper, uh, seeing our results. And our results are almost the same for the elderly or the young patient. Uh, is the position is good. I agree. Thank you. And my last question, questions, I think it's quite very tough question. You told that you always uh, try to um, remove the tumor completely and uh, dissect the capsule of the tumor from the facial nerve. So in practice, what would you, what would you do if you uh, have a decrease of uh, amplitude on facial nerve, 50, about 50%? Yes, would you I stop, just, would you leave, or would you go on? I go on. I just uh, uh, stop at first, wait a little bit, irrigate okay. in papaverin. But papaverin. if you have a very small portion of the tumor attached to the facial nerve, I'm always asking me, uh, why don't you remove that? Because uh, if you have a large piece of tumor, it's difficult. But you have a, a small one where <laughs> with a high magnification, we can perform, uh, uh, Dr. Professor Ono showed uh, very nicely this uh, uh, vascularization, very small thin vessel. Then I can remove also this space for, uh, from the facial nerve. That's, okay. that's my opinion. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I had a great pleasure uh, uh, this chatting with you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Finally, I want to have some comment from Professor Amrad Fouad. Uh, Prezad, thank you for hearing uh, our discussion. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you uh, very much uh, for excellent presentation, Professor Ricardo Ramina, and it was excellent presentation. And uh, but learning and our educational purpose, especially, it was useful for us and for uh, for young neurosurgeons. And. Uh, uh, it's difficult for us also because with limited resources, like a country like Afghanistan, and uh, uh, it was difficult to do it, but uh, uh, we uh, uh, learned a lot of from you and for uh, your experience. Thank you very much. Congratulations for your achievement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for these comments. And I always, uh, I'm thinking about uh, the time I worked with Majid Sami. It was uh, the 80s. At that time, we, don't, uh, we didn't have so many research. And, but uh, Majid Sami is a, a master of technique. <laughs> and the results at that time was, were very good also. That means we can perform good surgeon if you uh, master uh, the microsurgery in all countries. Uh, because at that time we operated the patient, and some patients had no MRI at that time. And uh, we had a lot of difficulty, but the results were quite good. That, that means we can perform good surgery even with uh, not so many research. Yes, thank you. Thank you. We appreciated your comments and also from uh, Professor Majid Sami. Uh, 
be proud of uh, you and proud of Majitza Mia as well. Uh, thank you. We totally agree with your, with your comment. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Thank you again. So thank you, Professor Ramina. So it's, it's a time running out, so a little bit to running out. So I just want to move on to the final third session. So here I welcome to welcome the Dr. Ha Heber Azos, doctor from Children's Center Hospital Foundation in Egypt from Cairo. Her topic is the left meaning of theory management. Okay, thank you for waiting. Please start your presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I hope now you can uh, see my screen. Yeah. Okay, Please. great. Uh, thank you, Professor Yoko Kato, for this educational webinar. Thank you. Uh, the show. Share the show, please. And share yeah. the slide. So, yes, I, as you know yes. this. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, great. So, uh, presenting about the spinal lipoma. Um, first of all, we have a key points about the embryology, the presentation and classification, and some operative notes. So uh, I'll start with the embryology. I, I know maybe most of the surgeon or most of the attendees don't like the embryology, but uh, go going back to the basics of uh, the newer science will help us to advance in the surgical uh, perspective. So the embryology, I will just go through, through it very briefly. It starts first with the primary new relation. It's uh, started at the third and the fourth week. So as we all know, as you can see at the slide, the, the neural tube, the blue one, the neural ectoderm, folds and makes a tube. It closes at 21 days and 25 days, the cranial and the caudal uh, points. And also leaving it the mesoderm, uh, the, the one which is in uh, yellow color, uh, separating it from the cutaneous ectoderm, the layer above. And we have the, the white thing uh, underneath is the notochord, which later on developed to be uh, the phylum terminal. So lipoma was first uh, thought to be a failure of disjunction only in the primary neurulation phase uh, from the separation of the cutaneous ectoderm and the neural ectoderm. The second phase of the embryology is the secondary neurulation. The secondary neurulation, as you can see, the pink part in the figure A, the caudal mass, it starts with a four process or four steps, aggregation of the caudal mass and then fusion of the caudal mass with the caudal part of the neural tube uh, fusion of the cord, which leads later on to the formation of the cornus medullaris and the cord equina. The final stage of the secondary relation is the degeneration of the to form the phylum terminal. This, so we can uh, summarize the embryology in four steps. It's the closure of the neural tube, uh, cranial and caudal, 21 and 25 days, and then the cavitation of the so uh, the caudal mass, um, and then the cavitation of the caudal mass and the regression. So there's the primary neurulation phase and the secondary neurulation phase. Honestly, there is actually another phase, which is the junction between the two neurulation process. The junction neurulation isn't really well uh, understood at the moment because most of uh, the understanding of the junction neurulation started at uh, or made at the animal studies, but simply it could be defined as the bridging step between the primary and the secondary relation phase. So in perigenesis and the pathophysiology of spinal lipoma, we can see that it's uh, mainly because part of it is a failed primary new relation, and this is the spinal uh, um, lipoma phase ap appearance. Uh, also, the secondary new relation process is more related to the closed spinal lesion lipoma. Um, there's also some part of the embryologists that consider that the spinal pathida that happened in the spinal lipoma could be either pathological spinal pathida that happened due to unformed uh, spine or fusion, and but most of it is actually a physiological spinal pathida that happens from the lipoma mass, uh, preventing the fusion of the two spinous process. Then, then it's called physiological spinal pathida. So uh, the clinical presentation of the lipoma, most of us will all know, it's a cutaneous uh, lesion, uh, stigmata, a mass, a neurological deficit like sphincteric or paraparesis, paraplegia, club feed deformity. Also, it could be associated with other spinal anomalies like double cord, uh, a tethering, of course, and um, 
maybe uh, the spina pavida in some cases or lipomeningitis. Also, it could be associated with other system anomalies, uh, cardiovascular, anorectal, sphincteric, and uh, urinary tract uh, anomalies. Radiologically, of course, we all also know, I uh, just want to stress about something. You could use the ultrasound, the X-ray, you could see the spina bifida, CT, and MRI. Uh, the, the main reason I'm mentioning the radio is because I want to emphasize on the use Uh, ultrasound. Ultrasound is a bad sign. Maybe it just needs a small uh, learning phase before we actually master it. That's very easy. So you can see in this phase, uh, this is a one week child. You could see the CSF, uh, which is the asterisk point. Uh, you could see the epidural fat. And the uh, curved arrow is the phylum terminal. This is a case of a tethered cord. You can find the asterisk is the conus, which is Nivated into nearly number four and five phase, and then the second phylum terminal with the arrow. Also, this case is a representation of ultrasound, and the lower figure is an MRI just to show the differences. And the ultrasound, you can find the isoechoic legion of the lipoma, and uh, then also you can find the cone is a little bit codally replaced. This also is a case of a lipoma case. You can see the ultrasound in the above image, lower image is MRI. You can find the huge mass of the lipoma and the tethering of the cord. So we will talk about the classification. The most known classification is the Chapman classification that we all know previously, the dorsal transitional and the caudal. And this classification is based upon the morphology of the lipoma and its relation to the spinal cord. Later on, areas classification, just introduce more the filer, phylum terminal lipoma. Fine classification is the one which commonly used at the moment. It's actually uh, he just conjoined the caudal and the phylum uh, lipoma into one category, which is terminal lipoma, and also differentiated the lipoma according to the embryology uh, to dorsal, transitional, chaotic, and terminal. The new classification that I want to talk to you about now is combination of um, the embryology and the morphology of the lipoma to four types. Uh, in this one, the terminal lipoma is divided into three and four, to the third and the fourth type. So the classification is uh, brought to by Professor Moroto from Tokyo um, Children Medical Center. The study was made between the, eight, the year 22 and uh, May 2015, almost 13 years. Uh, he included 677 patients of lipoma cases with different types. And the classification uh, simplified into type one is a primary neurulation failure. Type two is a primary and secondary neurulation failure, which is adjacent to the junctional uh, lipoma that we all know. Um, the third one is the secondary neurulation in the early phase. And then the fourth one is in the late phase of the secondary neurulation phase. So why is this uh, classification is very important? Also, it's because based on the embryology, uh, it will give us a more understanding on the depth of the lipoma and how to operate and what to do, including the tethering process specifically and how much we can resect of the lipoma. So type one, the primary neurulation phase, uh, this is, as we've mentioned before, the disjunction between the cutaneous and the neural ectoderm. So the lipoma had a, a dural defect uh, increase the size and push the cord anteriorly, or maybe anteriorly and laterally. So there is a dural defect and there is a bifid spine. Which we call uh, pathological bifid spine. It could be removed. It's not extremely hard, but uh, it could be achieved at the end. Type two is the transitional one that we all know, or the chaotic lipoma. Uh, this one, it could be the most challenging one. It has a spina bifida that attached to the spinal roots. And the thing is, hence, it's a secondary neurulation process. So the conus medialis that we've mentioned in the first uh, or the second uh, slide uh, is undifferentiated. It's not yet developed. So it merged with the spinal lipoma. And that's why this type is very difficult to resect completely. And there's no reason to resect to excise the whole uh, lipoma completely because part of it is actually the cornus medullaris. And this part also means that there's no phylum terminal. So the tethering process in this uh, type isn't actually necessary. 
Of course, you would rely on the electrophysiological monitoring, but hence the, the conus medullaris and the final terminal isn't yet developed. So the tethering uh, isn't for the phylum terminal. Type three, as we've mentioned, it's the early part of the second relation process. Uh, this one is not a pathological spina bifida, uh, and actually um, maybe just enlargement of the sacral hiatus. Uh, so we can see the on the X-ray the the spines are actually intact, uh, enlarging in the uh, sacral hiatus maybe there. That's where the subcutaneous fat has enlarged and find its way out. out. It's attached to the core medullaris, and the, hence the, the phenomena of presentation. The, those cases are actually presented in an older age, uh, like a young patient and not in infant cases. The first two types will be more presented in infants from starting to one week to one month. Uh, type four, this called is the late secondary neurulation failure. It's actually just uh, ineffective degeneration which as we all know is the phylum lipoma. So this one is relying more on the tethering, it's easiest uh, one for excision. And uh, maybe there is a, a spina bifida, which is again a physiological one. And you could see the thickening of the MRI through whether the, uh, the phylum terminal through MRI or the ultrasound. Uh, this is a case presented from the type one. You could see the cord is pushed anteriorly. Uh, by the lipoma, and in the axial, you could find it that's pushed anteriorly also onto the lateral. And you find them from the image of uh, uh, number F that there is actually a plane between the lipoma and the nerve root. A very important part of the excision of the lipoma in these cases is uh, not only uh, we have to excise or find the interface in the dorsal aspect of the dura, but also on the lateral aspects uh, to the nerve roots. Association uh, type two and type three. Uh, are mostly associated with sacral anomalies. Hence, they are first part of the secondary neurulation process uh, of the uh, neurulation defect. So it's very common to find uh, inner or sacral hypogenesis. Uh, the other associated anomalies, uh, like uh, urinary tract uh, uh, anomalies or uh, other maybe digestive tract anomalies can be found in the three. It could be also found more in the two and third of the lipomas. So timing for removing a lipoma for asymptomatic patient or symptomatic patient. Of course, if there's a symptomatic patient, the sooner the better. And uh, sometimes people actually advocate uh, to follow up and whenever there is any symptoms developing to excise the lipoma. We have to put also in mind that the, um, the growth or the pubertal phase, uh, adolescent timing uh, in the new generation is getting sooner than uh, previously. Um, some people have mentioned it to weight gain to the hormonal food uh, placement, or some people actually also, some papers have uh, called the COVID to be a reason of the early puberty phase. Uh, of uh, both genders, more in the female. Uh, other something that we have to mention and to be aware of is the associated anomalies. Uh, other than the uh, cardiovascular and uh, sphincteric anomalies, we have to focus on the presence of sometimes double cord diplomaidia or diastatomaidia, and this is very important in the tethering process. There has to be a fibrous band between the two cords that has to be cut earlier than the tethering. Uh, the third one is the metronome. Uh, if anyone is into music, uh, you will understand that the metronome is a very important part in the orchestra playing because it's the synchronized uh, all plays together. And the metronome in this operation is the electrophysiological monitoring. Uh, continuous electrophysiological monitor is very crucial to identify the nerve roots, especially in chaotic and transitional one is very tricky. Uh, which brings us to the fourth point, which is the anesthesia. Of course, as we use uh, neurophysiological monitoring, um, neuromuscular blockers and inhalation and uh, sedation isn't recommended. Propofol and Debrevan may be the, the best choice for the cases. Uh, the, the fifth point is the thermal in, uh, injury. A lot of us, we will find the plane to dissect using the bipolar. And we think that we didn't uh, damage any nerve root, but uh, the thermal energy uh, injury from the bipolar is actually enough to damage some of the roots. It, it could be very temporary, of course, but we should rely on uh, irrigation and sharp dissection of the plane rather than the bipolar dissection. Tethering, I've mentioned earlier, we just need to know the type would help us to know if there is actually a phylum terminal to look for and tether. 
and the presence of a secondary congenital anomaly that like a double code fibrous band to cut before the tethering. And then the closure, the important part of the closure is we need to have a smooth surface, surface of the dura, of the cord of the neural placode before closure, because this avoid the retethering of the cord and a complication. And as we all know, the operation on the recurrent cases is much, much worse than the, the original pathology. So having as much as, pos as possible a smoother surface of the neural placode in the closure process is very important to to decrease at least to minimize the retethering options uh, as the patient grows older. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Heber Azos. Uh, you mentioned so many uh, in detail classification and uh, every classification, what, how to treat the patient it's a good candidate for the patient thank you so thank you. is there thank you is there any comment so finally i just want to have the comment from professor alexander thank you for waiting thank you have some comment for the young neurosurgeon including uh, the thank you uh, thank, thank you, you for, for, for professor. So, Doctor Razo, thank you, uh, thank you very much, and uh, my con congratulations with the excellent presentation, uh, excellent, excellent literature review, excellent uh, analysis of the material, and uh, excellent presentation. But by itself, it's really I really enjoyed. It. Thank you very much. I cannot comment in general because you told everything. What maybe maybe I may ask you about the timing of surgery for this pathology in uh, in in children and neonates. Uh, it's, it's, it's important. Uh, what is your option from literature from your experience? Um, okay, and in my experience is uh, actually the sooner we discover it, uh, we operate for many different reasons. Is because uh, the sooner that the patient have a complication or to manifest with symptoms, the recovery is much worse. Uh, the main uh, trick point is if, if the patient is completely normal, we are very concerned about the sphincteric anomalies or the sphincteric disturbance post-operative. Um, and this, this point is actually the, the dilemma of the lipoma is to operate and to risk it or not. But uh, we have also to include the patient's family in this decision-making. Uh, I think this is a very important point. Okay, thank you. And um, if you go on this uh, topic, uh, what do you think about uh, perspectives of uh, performing intrauterine uh, surgery for these patients? It's more abstract uh, question for me, for me because I'm not pediatric, but just just a question. What do you think about it? Is it, is it worse about to think about it or not? Uh, would it uh, I, I didn't have any experience with it myself. I just read about it. But uh, the, the, the main idea that I've gathered from my reading is the risk of actually uh, terminating the pregnancy through this procedure is very high at this exact moment. Okay. So uh, maybe we could wait and see. Maybe this uh, uh, option would be included may more in the meningomail uh, seal, mm -hmm. whereas there's the spinal cord already outside. So, mm. but not in the lipoma cases. Okay, thank you. Maybe I agree with you because the risk of complication of this procedure may, may be much, much more higher than the consequences uh, after surgery, after, after delivery of the new work. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you and all the best. Yeah, excellent comment. Thank you. Thank you. So how about uh, Professor Piru Zato? Before you yes, uh, some comments. Thank you, thank you, uh, Professor Heba Azuz. Salam alaikum. Uh, thank you. But in a nice presentation and an achievement. And uh, uh, you you mentioned uh, about neurological deficit and uh, what's your uh, management and plan for neurological deficit in such kind of cases? Uh, lipoma cases. The management of lipoma cases. Uh, neurological deficit, uh, like... Oh, uh, okay. A urological deficit. Uh, 
Uh, th there is a very uh, important trick that I've seen in my practice. Uh, I'm not I'm not yet a professor just to, to start with, but in my uh, limited experience, I've seen that uh, sometimes there are temporary deficit post-operative. So intermittent catheterization and training, even for the young children, is uh, could, could help in maintaining the sphincter back. Uh, of course, we could do uh, urological examination and uh, urodynamics, Pre-operative and post-operative can give us uh, an impression: is there an actual deficit or not? But sometimes, the if the patient is intact pre-operative, sometimes he can have a manifest temporary uh, post-operative from the manipulation um, procedure, and he could recover later on. So, intermittent catheterization and training, even for children, could could be useful, like three three hours, and then remove the clamp, uh, something like that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There may be uh, most, uh, some more question and comment, but uh, it's time is running out. So I'm sorry to cannot accept all questions for you. So finally, hey, I just want to. Sachin. Sachin, yeah. please. Okay. Sachin, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Yeah. So, congratulations, Heba. <laughs> I think you are improving day by day, and you made a wonderful presentation. Uh, this particular entity uh, is very common in India, uh, lipomyelocele and lipomeningomyelocele. Uh, my question to you is, I've got two questions. First is, what do you do if the patient has uh, 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 hydrocephalus uh, mm -hmm. along with the lipomyelocele? If the patient has hydrocephalus, how do you proceed? Do you directly operate or uh, you take any precaution? One thing. Second thing, if the first child has uh, lipomeningocele. Do you take any precautions or any measures uh, in order to not to have the next child uh, uh, have the same disease? Uh, these are my two questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, I think that the idea of um, uh, siblings having the same thing is more in the uh, meningomyelocele than the lipoma. Uh, uh, but uh, Neither the less, uh, some intrauterine or pre uh, pre delivery test like alpha fetal protein tests could be done to assure that the the second child would have it or not, and then also the family should be included in the decision of uh, continuing or terminating this this uh, uh, pregnancy. Uh, about the first question is uh, the hydrocephalus with the lipoma or lipomeningocele. Most of the cases I didn't see a lipoma with a hydrocephalus, but I, I've seen it a lot with the meningocele and meningomyeloceles. So uh, sometimes, uh, according to the ratio of the ventricular megaly, sometimes uh, the ventricles could be enlarged, uh, but the, the brain catch up phase uh, when the, the, the patient grow up, uh, this ventricular megaly isn't actually something, but you could see if the ventricular megaly is, is huge. I would recommend a VP shunt immediately preoperative because it improves the healing of the wounds and prevent all complication of meningitis and wound breakage and all of this. So, so uh, occipital frontal circumference and the ratio of the ventricular megaly uh, and also the size of the meningeal seal, if it's a huge meningeal megaly seal, you have no ventricular megaly, sometimes those cases actually developed uh, hydrocephalus. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. All the best uh, for your future uh, training. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sachin. Okay, okay. let's okay. move on to the final closing remarks. Professor Yoko Kato, can, I, can, I, can you give me give us a comment? <laughs> Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Okay. So the, uh, every time the YNS webinar is getting exciting. So it's already 9.30 p.m. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for uh, especially Dr. Ono. He's uh, still very young, but the, the, he is a very high skill. And maybe uh, the young doctors can uh, uh, follow his step. I think he watched the... Uh, so many uh, skillful neurosurgeons, the surgery in, uh, in, in person or some video, I think. Uh, also, I say, uh, we all encourage your future uh, career. Thank you very much. Also, the Lamina, maybe the, the recall already he left, uh, that he is one of the giant of the skull base, especially the, the, 
the best version of us. Uh, I think he is. Uh, oh, <laughs> Ricardo, thank you very much for <laughs> your excellent the uh, congratulations. Your very great lectures. So I, I think I don't know the someone who can does the surgery just like you, uh, but we should follow your the uh, recommendation and the, uh, your teaching. Thank you very much. You. And the uh, uh, Heber, uh, the my congratulation to your uh, almost finished your fellowship. Uh, she is in Tokyo, and uh, a week later she will be going back to the Cairo. Uh, uh, wish you a very successful your future career. So we will see in, in Cairo or some other place. So and also the uh, discussant, the Alexander, the all the time that you uh, uh, gave us a very nice comment and also the encouragement of the YNS. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much, and also the uh, uh, Fawad. Thank you very much for uh, we should really get still still some uh, the uh, we cannot give you some VP shant set so uh, maybe we, we must figure out the <laughs> uh, this problem. Thank you very much. So anyway, uh, the Sachin. Uh, so, so all the best. Yeah, so, Just you can uh, tell us some uh, information or please. Yes. Yes. So before we close, I have uh, three announcements to make. One is our next webinar. So this webinar, ACNS YNS webinar, we conduct every second and fourth Sunday. So today was the second Sunday. The next one will be on the fourth Sunday that falls on 28th of May, 28th of May, same time. We'll come back with some exciting uh, faculties and uh, good lectures. So please uh, count on that, one thing. Second thing about our uh, future ACNS uh, uh, education activities. Uh, our next uh, conference, uh, the ACNS uh, 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 World Second Young Neurosurgeon Congress will be in Indonesia uh, from 29 July to uh, 4th uh, to 2nd August. So I would request all the young neurosurgeons to send the abstract and uh, go online and uh, search for the details of this uh, particular uh, conference because we have exciting hands-on workshop and uh, uh, the ACNS uh, Silk Road uh, uh, Central Asia uh, collaboration uh, conference will be in September. It will be in uh, Uzbekistan. So I request uh, all the young neurosurgeons and especially the young neurosurgeons from Central Asia to please kindly uh, register and come to uh, Uzbekistan for this uh, particular conference. So thank you very much. I will we'll see you on 28th of May. Thank you. Arigato Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. So, uh, 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 I think I will have a discussion with Prof. Yoko Kato and uh, then I'll work on it. Okay. 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 Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Are you okay now? I, I'm okay now. I'm, I'm fine. Perfectly fine. Thank okay. you. Thank nice you. to see you. Okay. Nice.